The last part of the adaptive immune system we really need to discuss is how the lymphocytes are able to generate such a diverse range of T-cell receptors and B-cell receptors or antibodies from a limited amount of genetic material. The processes underpinning this incredible feature of the immune system are the subject of this video. As we have moved through this course, we have seen that T-cells and B-cells are able to react to a hugely diverse range of antigens including ones that we have never previously encountered, such as the novel coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 that is responsible for the COVID-19 pandemic. With each B and T lymphocyte expressing a unique antigen-specific receptor, immunologists quickly realised that there wasn't enough capacity within our cells to encode all the potential combinations of receptors. Early predictions suggested that about 10 to the 7 antibodies were present in mice, which is actually a vast underestimate. But even then, if approximately 2,000 nucleotides are required to encode an antibody, the mouse would need around 2 times 10 to the 10 nucleotides just to encode its antibodies. Yet the entire mouse genome is only around 2.8 times 10 to the 9 nucleotides in total. So something doesn't add up, and there must be another process underpinning this diversity. Now the reason that we are talking about the B and T cells together when it comes to diversity is because a lot of the processes are the same in the different receptors. And if you look at the overall structure of the BCR or antibody and the TCR, you can see that they are similar with domain-like structures with constant and variable regions. So it's not surprising that the diversification process probably co-evolved. The diversity that we see in these molecules is generated by the random rearrangement of specific gene segments that we inherit from our biological parents, and this reordering of DNA only occurs for antibodies and T-cell receptors, and the part of the molecules that we are focusing on here is the antigen binding site at the end of the molecules. That diversity is due to the amino acid sequence in the hypervariable or complementarity determinant regions of the variable domains. And each domain that makes up the binding sites for the antigen has three of these hypervariable domains separated by these less variable framework regions. Despite the fact that there is a lot of similarities in the generation of diversity, there are also quite a lot of differences between the receptors and the way they work. So B cell receptors combine to free antigens as well as those presented by other antigen presenting cells, whereas T cell receptors are MHC restricted so they require the peptide they recognise to be processed and presented in the MHC binding groove. B-cell receptors can be membrane-bound or free in solution as antibodies, with alternative RNA processing responsible for these two different forms. But T-cell receptors are always membrane-bound. The interaction between the receptors and their cognate antigen is different too, with the B-cell receptor having a higher affinity for its antigen compared to the T-cell receptor which makes sense when you consider that the T-cell receptor MHC interaction is an on-off interaction over a period of between 12 and 24 hours. So we know that the receptors are highly variable. We know that there isn't enough genetic material to encode all the receptors individually. And we now understand that we have different segments that belong to different families. And we take one gene segment from each of those families and assemble them in a random way to form a piece of DNA which is then transcribed and translated into the functional protein that creates the diversity in the BCR or TCR molecules. This process is called gene rearrangement and is also known as somatic DNA recombination or BDJ rearrangement. Let's examine this process in more detail to understand what is going on using the heavy chain of the B cell receptor as an example. But please bear in mind that the process is the same in the T cells and this process is happening during the developmental stage of cell maturation in the bone marrow or the thymus. The gene encoding the variable domain of the heavy chain is made up of three families of genes, B, D and J, which stand for variable, diversity and joining. The constant region is then encoded as a separate region made up of multiple segments. So here we have a schematic of the gene encoding the heavy chain of the B cell receptor. We have variable region 1, variable region 2, all the way through to the last variable region, designated as Vn. And each of these variable regions is preceded by a leader peptide that directs a protein into the cell's secretory pathway. 
Then we have the diversity regions, D1, D2, all the way through to the final diversity segment, Dn. And for the heavy chain, we have the J regions, J1 to J6. Note that all the variable regions appear next to one another. Then all the diversity regions, and finally all the joining regions. There are also nine segments that encode the constant region, which is where the genes that encode the different FC regions that allow for class switching reside. And we discuss these in a video on B lymphocytes. What is going to happen during VDJ recombination is that we are going to select one segment from the V family, one segment from the D family, and one segment from the J family at random, and join these together to form a unique piece of DNA that will encode the Fab region of the antibody. Because remember, this process is also happening in the light chain as well as in the T cell receptor. So what is happening during the BDJ recombination process? Well, the first step is a DJ rearrangement, which splices out an entire section of the DNA between a randomly selected D segment and a randomly selected J segment. So in this case, the region between D2 and J4 is deleted, and D2 and J4 align themselves together in the new sequence of DNA. In the next step, we see VDJ rearrangement, so the process is repeated, but this time a segment from the variable region is selected at random, and the DNA between that segment and the newly combined DJ segment is spliced. So in this example, we see V2 being aligned with the D2J4 segment. This section of DNA is going to be transcribed into RNA as a primary transcript. And this whole process has to be very tightly regulated to ensure that the D and J segments align correctly and the V segment aligns to that DJ segment. And this is under the control of a series of recombination signal sequences, or RSSs, which are non-coding sequences that are located next to the recombination sites and ensure correct joining. Here we have a segment of DNA showing random V, D and J regions. And either side of these gene segments, we have non-coding RSSs, which are designated 23 or 12. And the reason for this is that sandwiched between a conserved heptamer and nonomer, there is a variable region that contains either 12 or 23 base pairs. The 12-23 rule means that only a 12 base pair RSS can bind to a 23 base pair RSS. So the only possible combination is for V to align next to D, which has to align next to J. Now you may have spotted that the primary transcript contains some additional regions that we need to trim out to produce a piece of DNA that can encode a functional heavy chain. And this happens during the next stage of RNA processing, where the regions from the J segment of the BDJ complex to the appropriate constant domain segment is spliced out. In the left-hand image, we see the region from J4 to C mu being removed, and in the right image, the region from J4 to C delta. Through the process of translation and transport to the endoplasmic reticulum, a functional B-cell receptor heavy chain is produced that will form the heavy chain of IgM on the left or IgD on the right, as defined by the constant region. Remember that this process is also occurring for the light chain. The only difference in the light chain is that light chains lack the D segments, so only the V and J segments are being joined, which is why you often see VDJ written with a D in brackets because it is VDJ in the heavy chain, but just VJ in the light chain. Something similar is happening in the T cell receptors. Again, clusters of gene segments that are randomly brought together to form a functioning TCR. So here we can see the germline DNA for the alpha chain at the top and the beta chain at the bottom. And through the same steps, we see the splicing out of the DNA between randomly selected V, D and J segments which are combined to form the alpha and beta chains on this CD4 positive T lymphocyte. So this table tries to provide some idea of how many different segments there are within each of these different families. And these numbers are estimates, but provide a good overview of how the huge diversity we see in our BCRs and TCRs, which in theory ensures we have coverage of every potential antigen we might encounter, is produced. So just looking down the immunoglobulin columns, we have approximately 59 B segments in the light chain and 40 in the heavy chain. We don't have D segments in the light chain, remember, but have 27 in the heavy chain, along with 9 and 6 joining segments in the light and heavy chain respectively. 
And these rounded combinations would only generate about 2 times 10 to the 6 different variable gene pairs, which is just not enough. So we have this process of junctional diversity, which exponentially increases the diversity, giving an estimated overall diversity in the order of 10 to the 13 different combinations. And a double star here indicates that that diversity in antibodies is even higher due to somatic mutations. So we need to discuss junctional diversity and somatic hypermutation next. Junctional diversity occurs as part of central diversification. So this occurs as the T or the B cell is maturing in the thymus or bone marrow respectively, and occurs particularly in complementarity determinant region 3, which you may remember we said is the most variable of the CDRs. Junctional diversity is the addition or subtraction of random nucleotides in the BDJ and BJ regions of BCRs and TCRs, and this produces a truly staggering range of receptors to ensure full coverage. B cells are also able to add another level of diversification on top of junctional diversity through their ability to class switch, which we discussed in detail in a previous video. But briefly, is the swapping of the constant region of the heavy chain from one antibody isotype to another, whilst retaining the antibody specificity of the variable domains. And finally, somatic hypermutation, which again can only occur in B cells, so T cells do not do this. But one of the first things that happens when a B cell is activated by its cognate antigen is that it will rapidly divide to produce a huge number of daughter cells or clones. Now, whenever DNA is being copied, there is the potential for errors to be introduced, and the V region has a very high susceptibility to point mutations like this. Any mutations that are disadvantageous to the B cell are deleted from the repertoire by apoptosis. So for example, if the mutation prevented the binding of the B cell receptor to the antigen, or it weakened its affinity. However, occasionally the point mutation is beneficial, increasing the affinity of binding, and these mutations are retained and a new antibody is formed. This permanent editing of the DNA in the daughter cells is called somatic hypermutation, and it allows the B cells to tweak their immune response and produce better antibodies upon subsequent exposure to a pathogen. And that brings us to the end of our journey through the adaptive immune system. In this video, we looked at the generation of diversification in T and B lymphocytes that allows them to generate a quite staggering array of T and B cell receptors that cover almost every eventuality through the process of VDJ recombination junctional diversification, and somatic hypermutation. I really hope that you have enjoyed this introduction to the immune system, and this helps you put some of the other diseases you have and will talk about in the remainder of this course into context.